retrenchment span at Spanish Texas in the 18th century because what we're going to look at is the fits and starts of Texas as a uh, colony and a province in in Spain it's Texas is uh, at the height let's uh, let's give you some statistics today it's Texas at its height of population by the time you get to somewhere around 1800 at the height of its population amongst countable Spanish subjects whether that means they're pure-blooded Spaniards, mestizo, which is a, of a mixed uh, race, meaning uh, Spanish and Indian, or Indian uh, converts. Texas only uh, manages to have a population of 30,000 individuals. That's it. Texas, by 1800, only has that many, and most of those 30,000 are going to be centered around really three settlements, one of which is uh, San Antonio de Bejar, or Villa de Bejar, as we've already said, the town of Bejar. The other settlements are La Bahia, which has got a community growing up around it, the Presidio, the Mission, La Bahia, uh, and there's a Villa going to be established as well. Uh, also remember, that's Goliad to us. Down around Victoria, go southwest of Victoria on Highway 59 by about 25, 30 miles. Goliad sits down that part of the world. And then in East Texas, Nacogdoches. East Texas and Nacogdoches is going to be the other major settlement uh, in this time period. For about a 100-year window, those are the three main towns in Texas. There will be other attempts and fits and starts of trying to settle Texas in this era, but they don't. the Spaniards really never get that far off the ground. One of the problems the Spanish are going to have, and I will come at this again and again, whether it's with the Spanish or later the Mexicans, is, is that the problem that they have in Texas, and it's a, a problem they never really solved, the Spanish never solved, was how do we get people to live here? How do we get people to move to Texas? Uh, and I, I, I talk about this in the form of a, in the lecture previously or several weeks ago now, I guess at this point. Uh, would you want to live in Texas if the, the weather was, uh, was a factor? I mean, most everybody sitting there got a fan uh, over Jack's head. It's uh, spinning around. Uh, let's see. Uh, everybody's, I think, Presley, I assume it's a meat locker over there at uh, Relis like normal. But my point is this, is, is that air conditioning and fans and modern accoutrements make it much easier. Well, that's only part of the story for why Texas is, is not habitable. It's also worth remembering, too, the Spanish can't convince their own people to move. Uh, if you were a Spaniard... Why would you move to Texas? And some may be thinking immediately, oh my gosh, I would want free land. Oh my gosh, I'd want cheap and abundant land. Well, the problem is, is that the Spanish don't hand out land because of their practices and caste system. The Spanish don't hand out land to Indians, basically, until, until about 1800 to 1810. If you are a Spaniard of pure blood or a very high-ranked uh, or well-thought-of mestizo, then you could perhaps get some land in Texas. However, most of those guys who would move to Texas don't have to. They don't have to move here to get land. The thing to remember about Texas population is, is that most of those Spaniards can get land closer to Mexico City. They can get land closer to Zacatecas. They can get closer to the heart of Mexico. Moving to Texas is like saying, okay, uh, I want free land. Well, sure, that's great. you got to move to North Dakota to get it. And I assume many of you would not want to move to North Dakota if you could, let's just say if the land was available in Oklahoma, you wouldn't want to move all the way to North Dakota. Think of it that way. Say you're a Texan, right? And you're, the land offered to you is in North Dakota, but you have to skip all this other open land between Texas and North Dakota. Why can't I just go to Oklahoma? Well, sometimes you can so anyways, uh, the Spanish never really get a good answer to getting people to live here. And they're going to try different things. So I guess one of the first uh, aspects we need to put in your notes here is this attempt to get others to live in Texas. And one of the things they will try, and God help them, they did try, is in, seven, in the 1730s. So let me give you a, de a rough uh, date. So 1730, basically, 1731. The Spanish are going to cast about for new settlers in Texas. And that means, particularly here, it means Santa, the Via de Bejar. Who do they look for? The answer, Canary Islanders. They will call for Canary Islanders to move to Texas. The Canary Islands are off the coast of Spain by several hundred miles. 
The Canary Islands were getting, by 1730, hard to uh, populate, or rather hard to uh, control, hard to supply. It was overpopulated. And so the thinking was, if we can get these Canary Islanders to move, in this case to Texas, to Behar, they will become, good, they will become the core of a new Texas settlement and can really hold that territory as they grow. Yes, ma'am, uh, Presley. Oh, you're just waving. Okay. So the thing is, is that the only, only about a 200 or so Canary Islanders come here. And they have only about 200 or so come to Behar. The thing is, is that when they move to Texas, they hate it for the most part. One of the ladies who's going to have a, a hand in bringing people over here, and she's really kind of a, a ringleader type of individual. Her name is Maria Betancourt. Maria Betancourt. Let me type that up for you right quick. Betancourt. B-E-T-A-N-C-O-U-R. Betancourt. Maria Betancourt is a, uh, a kind of, she is a widow, and she's got several children. And the fact that she is assertive as a female, which kind of flies in the face of the Spanish practice and habits uh, in the 1730s, uh, is noteworthy. And she is a, a leader type of individual. They get to Behar, and these uh, uh, Canary Islanders don't like it. They kind of regret that they had gotten involved in uh, the move to Texas. They caused headaches for the Viceroy of, of New Spain. They caused headaches of the gov for the governor of Texas, and it seemed like basically all they did was complain, bellyache, and moan. But that is one attempt at trying to settle Texas and trying to get more people to live in Texas it is, in a sense, like an overarching theme of this, uh, these lectures or this, this time period in Texas history, a successful failure. Successful in the sense that they got uh, islanders to move to Behar. Failure in the sense that they really didn't stick or rather they didn't uh, grow beyond uh, the basics. But at the same time, too, when we talk about these uh, communities that are going to grow up around these missions and presidios, we need to add some uh, local flavor into your notes now. And uh, one of the things that uh, is stereotypical about Texans to this day, and for those of you who have traveled, uh, who, who, who of you, uh, just curious for a second here, let me uh, pause my recording, known for in Texas is the issue of cattle. And I assume, let's see, where are you at, uh, Jacob? Uh, let's see, are you, no, Blake's the Yoakum boy. Jacob, are you uh, Yoakum as well? But anyways, uh, all that to say is, y'all got any cattle, Blake? Cattle, uh, the cattle industry in Texas, you may, some of you may think the cattle industry in Texas started somewhere in the Anglo period of Texas history. That's not actually true at all. Cattle in Texas uh, predates the Anglo arrival to Texas by, uh, let me think a second here, by about 120 years, arguably a little longer than that, but let's just say 120 years. When the Spanish start to missionize Texas, when they start to build those missions and presidios in East Texas, and especially the stopover point via de Bejar and the mission around or San Antonio de Valero, the mission, uh, which is later the Alamo, of course, and La Bahia, they will bring with them cattle. We need to talk about that just for a few minutes. The cattle industry is born with the Spanish. The Spanish will bring with them thousands of heads of cattle into Texas. And some of those cows will uh, be sold uh, here. They will be handled there. They will be used as food or as a part of the economy of these missions and presidios. However, uh, some of those cows, worth noting as well, will go feral. Or right, that's my term. That's not exactly right for a cow, but they will go wild, and they will run off. And where do they run off to? They run off wherever they want to go. There is no bob wire in Texas. There are no fences to speak of in Texas. It is open range. And some of those cattle will drift off, and uh, some, thousands of cows over the years, will drift off and head south of the Nueces River. The Nueces River, as you should remember, is the river that flows into Corpus Christi Bay and flows back through the brush country of Texas uh, and basically separates the valley, say the Rio Grande Valley, Brownsville, McAllen, Hidalgo, uh, and separate Corpus Christi from that territory. And that's what we call the Nueces Strip. When you think of the great cradle drives of the 18, 1870s, that's where those cows come from. But they are descendants of these Spanish herds that we're discussing here in the, in the early 1720s. 
these Spanish cattle herds are going to grow, grow, and grow, and they become fairly profitable. In fact, actually, when we, we talk about these uh, Spanish uh, herds, the, uh, we, the word we should use in our notes instead of cowboy, frankly, is the Spanish word of vaquero, the vaqueros who are going to handle these cows, most of whom the vaqueros, from my reading, has been as they were actually uh, Indians that had been missionized, uh, especially as you go through the 1700s. These are missionized Indians who become, to use Eng English now, uh, cowboys, and they were good. But the vaquero, I want to chase this rabbit just for a second because you may not have known this part. The vaquero, the cowboy, takes his lineage, not from the Anglos either, he takes it further back. His way of living, his way of handling cows comes from Mustangers. Los, uh, let me see if I've got the word right in front of me. Los, uh, oh shoot, Mestineros, I believe it is. Uh, give me one second, I've got it written down right in front of me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Los Mestineros, M-E-S-T-E-N-E-R-O-S, -E -E Mestineros. There's a tilde. Los Mestineros. I'll call them Mustangers, but these are fellas who learn how to corral and to capture wild Mustangs, wild horses. When the Spanish came to Mexico in, the 15, in 1519 with Cortez and everybody who comes after him, they will bring with them uh, horses after horses after horses. One of the things, as we'll discuss more today, is that the, the horse becomes very valuable. It becomes a heck of a war-making tool, not just for the Spanish, which we've already dis uh, lectured on in this class, but the horse becomes a very valuable tool to the Native Americans, especially, put this tribe in your notes, the Comanches. Uh, no greater example of horsemanship than you can find with a Comanche. The Spaniards, after 1519, are going to lose horses. They're going to have horses stolen, and they will sell horses. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. They will sell horses to or trade them with tribes. So these horses are going to go wild, uh, widely through Mexico, and by extension, northern Mexico. And these Mestineros, these Mustangers, are going to capture the horses, and the way they do it, if you're familiar with cattle at all, as far as the form of corrals and pins and wings and this guy and that, a fellow who throws the gate, people who herd the, uh, the cows, all those practices and habits we take for granted, if you know anything about cows that are directed toward cows, all those practices and habits actually come from the Mustangers who, by the way, took their heritage, this last part, I want you to understand how far some of this stuff can go, they took their heritage all the way back to North Africa from the Moors. So when you talk about the Texas cattle kingdom, some of the earliest headwaters of cows and cow practices and cow punching, if you want, come from North Africa, from the Moors. Well, the Mustangers then are to have their practices taken from the cattlemen or taken by the cowboys, or the vaqueros. The vaqueros are running these ranches in South Texas. The reason you're going to have great cow ranches in South Texas isn't just because of the mission. Please put this in your notes. If you've ever been around Goliad and you've ever been around La Bahia, heck, even if you've been on the east side of San Antonio around, uh, say, I-10, Ackerman Road, Kirby, and Floresville, and Seguin, and that part of the world, and, and I understand Seguin's not in Bear County. I understand that. The thing is, is that all that territory through there headed down to the coast is in its natural state, great prairies, open prairies. There are no, the trees are very limited because most of those trees that you see today are growing along old fence lines or were planted because there are houses there. There are trees in south uh, and east of San Antonio, but it's really more of a prairie grasslands. And the great cattle kingdoms, the great cattle uh, herds are going to be found along those prairie lands because of abundant water and the, uh, the herdsmanship of the vaquero. The contribution Texas gives to the American Revolution in 1776 is only really one contribution, and that is cows. And that's cows. But as the Spaniards build these missions, San Antonio de Valero, La Bahia, and so forth. They will bring thousands and thousands of cows with them and they will populate and spread widely. These are the beginnings of the Texas cattle industry in the cattle kingdom right here.
It doesn't, it uh, by a hundred years predates the Anglos. So uh, the, uh, the Spanish, however, was we move our narrative forward. The Spanish are still casting about looking for ways to expand their footprint in Texas and figure out ways to turn uh, some of the Native Americans into good uh, taxpayers, Spanish subjects, Catholics, and hold the land in a sense as cheaply as possible. The Spanish in, let me see if I've got my uh, uh, notes here. The Spanish in 1749, let's move our uh, timeline along now. The Spanish in 1749 are going to cast about and are asking, where can we build a new Mission Presidio complex? Where can we put a new Mission Presidio complex in the ground? And the answer comes back in 1749, why don't we do it along the banks of the San Gabriel River? Now, the San Gabriel, if you're uh, from the Georgetown area, if you've driven through Georgetown, San Gabriel is one of the little branches that runs right under I-35. But around Milam County, put this town in your notes, Rockdale. Rockdale is uh, really the main channel of this little San Gabriel River. This Mission Presidio complex, this, the, uh, the uh, San Saba, uh, Mission Presidio, excuse me, San Saba, San Xavier Mission Presidio Complex is found in and around Rockdale, Texas, in central Texas. One of the things the Spanish are dealing with at the midpoint of the 18th century is a changing uh, reality amongst the Native Americans who live in Texas or around Texas. You have a bunch of different tribes in Texas. The Karankawa Indians who are down along the coast have largely been pacified. The Karankawas are those great tall uh, tri uh, Indians that I talked about before in a previous lecture that uh, should be on eCampus. The thing is, is that you have the Karankawas and the Qualitecans. They, the Qualitecans, uh, this turbulent little tribe, they make up your vaquer vaqueros. But in central Texas and in north Texas and west Texas, where some of you come from and where we are, uh, you have other tribes that do uh, different things. Last time we talked about the Catawans and their great desire to trade, but a, less, a far lesser desire to become good Catholics. But in central Texas, you're going to have several tribes that are uh, noteworthy, one of which, let's put them in your notes, is called the Tonkawa, the Tonkawa Indians. The Tonkawa Indians, and there's a whole bunch of little subgroups amongst them, the Tonkawa Indians basically moved into Texas, best we can tell, a couple, about a thousand, a couple thousand years ago, and because their language is very distinct from everybody else's, uh, the Tonkawa name is was given to them by the Waco Indians. The city of Waco is named for an Indian tribe. But anyways, the Wacos referred to uh, the referred to this uh, group as the Tonkawa, which means they stick to themselves and they don't want anybody to come over and visit. Sometimes uh, it is true and sometimes it's not about Native American names. They have one name and it seems like, oh my gosh, it has a lot of meaning. They stick to themselves and they don't want anybody to come over and visit. That's what the Waco name Tonkawa means. They, the Tonkawa, as, we, as I call them, they referred to themselves as the Tawakoni, which means the most human of people. Put this in your notes now. The Tonkawa Indians, however, are, are survivors. If you talk about all these tribes in Texas, perhaps the most consummate survivor tribe is, is the Tonkawa. They got with a winner. Whoever they, the Tonkawa, believed was the to uh, dominant force in their region or wherever they were, they got real close to them. I mean, they, they made alliances. Uh, they go the full Monty uh, in making alliances. What I mean by uh, making such a thing? Uh, when I say they make alliances, I mean they will not only sign treaties, they will fight with their new allies, fight for their new allies. Even thirdly, they will make a point to intermarry amongst their allies. They, are, they have no compunction about uh, you know, going, doing that too. So they are very uh, much a believer in surviving. They're never going to be the greatest tribe in Texas. They're never going to be a top dog. But they are a survivor, and they, just, they, they, they switch with the winds. At times, in the, for your notes, you will find the Tonkawa allied with the Spanish, at times uh, in Texas history, you'll find them allied with the Comanches. At times in Texas history, you'll find the Tonkawa allied with the Republic of Texas, the United States government, the Confederate States of America, and so forth. They get with whoever they think is the top dog. And 
one last thing about them, two last things actually. One is they are great, uh, or they were great scouts. It was remarked again and again by the Texas Rangers, by Mexican uh, vaqueros, by uh, by the Spanish before them. They would say about the Tonkawa is those guys can find anybody, and they could. They were the great scouts. If you wanted somebody to track down a, 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 a band of Comanche, the Tonka is who you may deal with because they could do it. Also worth noting, too, is, is that the Tonkawa, they're also cannibals. That is a common theme. In fact, most of the Texas Indians uh, that we deal with uh, are cannibals to some degree or another. But of all the different tribes in Texas, this group, the Tonkawa Indians, which will be in San Xavier in 1756, will be the only tribe that eats, to my knowledge, that eats human flesh for the enjoyment of it. They like the taste of it, and, and they ate for that reason right there. They did not eat human flesh for spiritual reasons. They ate it for food. And so they, uh, there's uh, one story, the man's name, write his name down in your notes, has uh, really got a great book in Texas history uh, from this time period, late, uh, late Tonkawa, late Karankawa stuff. I've, it's, it's really fun to read. This guy's name is Noah Smithwick. Noah Smithwick. Uh, it's called uh, Recollections of Old Texas Days. Noah Smithwick was a uh, Texas Ranger in his uh, 20s. Uh, Rangers were not a formal organization back then, strictly speaking. But Noah Smithwick, uh, he knew Tonka was, and a lot of what we know about their tracking ability comes from Smithwick and has been backed up anecdotally elsewhere. And Smithwick said one day he was, uh, they had been tracking some uh, Comanches, I believe it was, in, out around Fredericksburg and out towards San, An- San Angelo territory, and they couldn't catch him. Uh, but uh, they were getting hungry. This uh, ranger outfit, was, which was being led by the Tonkawa, uh, by Tonkawa scout, where they were getting hungry, or a couple of scouts, in fact. He said that uh, he'd wa- he was out of, outside of camp one day. He comes up, Smithwick does, and he smells this uh, fla- uh, fragrant aroma. And he finds these two Tonkawa scouts cooking and cooking. And then he's like, man, this feels so good. It smells so good because all he had was parched, he, Smithwick, had had was parched corn. And he goes up to these uh, Tonkawa who are cooking, and they're like, man, what is in there? It smells good. And these guys were like, oh, we found ourselves a Comanche. Do you want one? Do you want some? And uh, he's like, no, 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 no. And he, he marched off in disgust. But uh, uh, the Tonkawa were the way they were. The reason I bring the Tonkawa up so much is, is that here at San Xavier in the 17, uh, in 17, the early 1750s, say this correctly now, in, in the early 1750s, is, is that you will find the San Xavier mission complex around present-day Rockdale directed to three bands of Indians, one of which is the Tonkawa Indians. The other two are the, let me see, the Cocos and the Diodos. So, the Cocos and the Diodos all speak different languages, uh, different from the Tonkawa. So there's really three missions around ro- present-day Rockdale on the banks of the San Gabriel. And in 1750, excuse me, in 1751, get the date right now. In 1751, the Spanish crown and the Spanish governor of Texas at, at San Antonio de Bejar, Villa de Bejar, greenlights the building of a presidio. If you build a presidio, you need a military commander. And this man ne- man's name needs to go into your notes. His name, Philippe Rabago e Turan. Captain Rabago. Philippe, let's see, I E F. Philippe Rabago. Philippe Rabago e Turan. Captain Rabago. This is one of the more infamous scoundrels you'll ever come across in Texas history. Captain Rabago. Captain Rabago was a wealthy man. Let's start out with his background. Captain Rabago in the Spanish army did not want to be in Texas. Being, and this is true in uh, Mexican history. It's true in Spanish history at times. Being stationed in Texas was uh, maybe not a kiss of death for your career, but it was certainly five years you'll never get back. Five years you won't enjoy. Five years of a distant posting. 
uh, perhaps it would be like saying uh, you were in uh, Diego Garcia, which is an island in the Indian Ocean or something like that, uh, that uh, if you were posted there, maybe you're posted at Bismarck, North Dakota in the Air Force. I I'm just throwing off some far-flung parts of uh, if you're in the U.S. Army or military. But Texas was uh, a forgettable assignment that you really didn't want. Uh, Captain Rabago en well enough enjoyed uh, Via de Bejar, and that was okay because there was some civilization, there was some time there. Uh, Captain Rabago was okay with that. But Captain Rabago will be sent. Captain Rabago will be sent as the Presidio commander to San Xavier, San and there in Rockdale, there at Milam County. Captain Rabago didn't want to go, and he was pissed off about it, and he's trying to figure out a way to get out of it. But he goes because he's a soldier and he is uh, ordered to go. And Captain Rabago, well, he, uh, along the route, he uh, evidently this started up before he left San Antonio, but may, or Bejar. It may have started on the way from Bejar to Milam County, or what we'll call Milam County, to Rockdale, San Xavier. But Captain Rabago is going to uh, take up and start having an affair, put this in your notes, with a man's wife. And, and the, I'm not just telling you to tell the story. It's going to get salacious in a minute. It's going to get pretty interesting. I'm telling you this story because it destroys the whole thing. The man's name, the tailor's name, is a guy named Juan Sabalos. Juan Sabalos. That is the tailor. Juan Sabalos was going to be a part of the, hopefully, there in early 1751, he was going to be hope, part of the, hopefully, the beginnings of a new little town, the Via de Rockdale. I'll call it that. And they didn't have a name for it yet, though. But hopefully, he would be part of the Mission Presidio complex. Juan Sabalos was married to a young woman. They're both in their 20s, as I kind of gather the, the details of the story. I'll be honest. I don't know the woman's name. I've ne I have read the story in various ways, and I've never come across the woman's name. But Mrs. Sabalos, we'll just call her this. Mrs. Sabalos evidently caught the eye of Captain Rabago, and Captain Rabago was a charming devil. And so they start up an affair. And we're not talking about thousands and thousands of people so you can hide your affair easily if you can do such a thing. These are tens and tens of people, and you probably can't hide the affair all that well. Sabalos is not happy. It causes a dissension in the, in the outfit, and oh, by the way, Captain Rabago is at the head of about 50 or 60 uh, soldados, soldiers. They, by, uh, what is it, about February, uh, oh no, I take that back, about May or June of 1751, they make it to San Xavier, so the summertime of 1751. Sabalos is upset about his wife having an affair. And Sabalos, the tailor, Mr. Sabalos, goes to the Catholic priest there at San Xavier's missions and says, tells him what's going on. And the Catholic priests uh, go back to Captain Rabago and they say, stop. And Rabago says, no, he won't. Well, well, if you can imagine what a, uh, the, I guess the, uh, I, I want to say the, um, What's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, the example, if you could imagine the example Captain, uh, Captain Rabago gives to his men, it is a very poor example. Captain Rabago's men are going to act like their leader. And Captain Rabago's men start, uh, to be blunt about it, sexually assaulting in some cases, seducing probably in others. Uh, Native women, Native American women, women, Indian women, there in the mission around San Xavier, the missions around San Xavier. It is a mess. It is a mess. And then in November 1751, now into the late fall, early winter of 1751, November 1751, Sabalos had been complaining vociferously about Rabago's repeated violations of his uh, marital, uh, his med marital relation, uh, marital, uh, his marriage, I should say, just simply. Captain Rabago arrests Mr. Sabalos, Juan Sabalos, chains him to the wall in the Presidio Brig, which is called the, basically the Presidio Jail. Sabalos, if you can imagine, is chained to the wall. He's under arrest. Captain Rabago had done this. And then Captain Rabago proceeds to drag a cot into the, into the uh, cell 
where Sabalos is chained to the wall. So, okay, you get the understanding here. Sabalos is chained to the wall. Rabago, Captain Rabago, drags a cot in, and then shortly thereafter comes Mrs. Sabalos. And Captain Rabago and Mrs. Sabalos are in coitus together in front of the husband who is chained to the wall. That is something you don't even hear about today. I mean, unless it's just off the wall crazy. Um, the thing is, is that eventually Sabalos was able to wiggle free and Sabalos runs to the mission and, and begs for sanctuary and receives it in the mission. On Christmas Day, 1751, that's an important day in the Christian calendar, as many of you would know. Uh, 1751, on Christmas Day, Captain Rabago rides his horse into the mission, ropes Mr. Sabalos, and drags him back to the Presidio and chains him up once more. All the time this is going on, Captain Rabago's men are assaulting or seducing the Indians, Indian women. The Native American men, some of whom are married to these women, are screaming and complaining and people are fleeing the, the mission. Captain Rabago is excommunicated. Put that in your notes. The, the priests there in, in uh, San Xavier are going to excommunicate Rabago and his entire command. When I say excommunicate, what does that mean? Excommunication is not just kick him out of the church. Excommunication means you're kicked out of heaven. You've got to understand the Catholic Church claims for itself the right, uh, the keys to the kingdom or the keys to heaven. It's all those, uh, if you ever see a statue of Peter in a Catholic church and he's holding a set of keys, it's a reference to uh, all that is bound Question. on earth. All that will be bound on earth will be bound in heaven and so forth and so on. Hang on, let me keep going. So, if you, from the understanding of the story that I have, is, is that after the Spanish, or excuse me, the Catholic priest there at San Xavier uh, excommunicate Rabago and his command, they, after about a week, turn around and beg the uh, priest for reconciliation. Please let us back in. We apologize. We're sorry. They were let back in because you have to. Now, the, the coup de grace, put this next part in your notes, this last part in your notes, as far as uh, there at San Xavier, is May 11th, 1752. May 11th, 1752. In the span of essentially six months sort of thing. But uh, on May 11th, 1752, the tailor, Sabalos, a couple of Catholic priests were sitting down for supper late in the evening. Or I say late in the evening, late in the afternoon. It's really early evening. The sun was just going down. And as these, these three men, two priests and, a, and that tailor are sitting down, shots ring out. Sabalos is drilled in the chest and a Catholic uh, priest who walks out to see the, where the shots had come from, he got shot from up underneath the arm and he falls over dead. The other Catholic priest fell out of his chair, the lights go out, and he's, that saved his life. The rest of the story is this. Captain Rabago is sent back to San Antonio. San Xavier collapses and fails as a mission, which is a common theme in these little small missions. They fail. In fact, actually, much of what I'm going to tell you today is about failure. Captain Rabago will be arrested under suspicion of murdering the Catholic priest and Mr. Sabalos. San Xavier will be sent back, or will be sent back basically down to San Marcos. So for those of you who have friends at Texas State University, San Marcos, Texas initially was not just a college town, of course, it was initially a mission presidio town. San Xavier will be moved back to San, San Marcos. I tell you all this to bring you to this next point as well. Put this uh, name, these next Indian tribe in your notes. The Apaches and the Comanches. The Apaches and the Comanches. Give me a second here to... All right. So, when we talk about the Indian tribes of Texas, now we've got two more to go with. The Lipan Apaches, Lipan Apaches, 
they are a uh, tribe that you find on the plains of Texas in the 1600s. You find the Lipan Apaches uh, in West Texas. You find them over west of San Antonio, south of San Antonio. In fact, you find Lipan Apaches even close to the coast down around Corpus Christi territory. The Lipan Apaches, they are pretty good horsemen. Let's we'll start off with that. They're pretty good horsemen. When I say good horsemen, they would be on the equivalent level of uh, some of the cavalry outfits you see in the Civil War and what have you. The Lipan Apaches, however, have some enemies. And so I guess you could say that's, uh, that's one part of the little story here. The Lipan Apaches, like every group under the sun, uh, under the sun have uh, uh, enemies. For the Apaches, their enemy are the Caddoans, as we start our story out. In the 1600s and the early 1700s, when the Spanish start to try to build uh, missions amongst the Caddoans, and they, the Spaniards are going to do some trading with the Caddoans in East Texas, for the Lipan Apaches, they thought that was just an example of Spanish treachery and Spanish betrayal. And so there will be fighting and there will be raiding from the Apaches into San Antonio de Bejar in the 1720s, in the 1730s, and so on. But while that is happening, the Comanche tribe, the Comanche tribe, which comes out of evidently the Ute nation, the Comanches, which were a, uh, a was it Shoshone, I believe it was, they come from that dialect and tongue, they come out of the mountains and they get onto the plains. Prior to their arrival on the plains, the Comanches were a hated and small and weak tribe. In fact, uh, the name Comanche kind of has a, the, the rough translation comes like this, he who will fight me all day long and never stop. That's essentially what Comanche means. He who fights me all day long and never stops. Well, the Comanches, once they got onto the plains, they got a hold of horses. And that is the turn of their history. If the Apaches knew how to uh, ride a horse, but then had to get off and fight, get off the horse and fight, bow and arrow style, this is the important thing about the Comanches. They were better by far. Um, if you think about some of the Greek mythologies, if you think about some of the, uh, I guess, Roman mythology as well, uh, you have, what is it, centaurs and mentors? If I remember correctly, though, it was a half horse, half uh, man. It's, I think it's a centaur if I remember my mythology correctly. The, th the fact of the matter is it's something like that. Though every person who ever saw and was honest about it, who saw a Comanche uh, a man in his prime riding on the back of a horse, said it was a, a sight to behold. They were that good a horseman. In fact, actually, uh, this one uh, Texas, uh, early Texas resident, I'd like to say his last name was Thrall, but I'd have to go back and check the note on it. But basically said this, he said, if you saw a Comanche walking, they didn't look very athletic. If you saw a Comanche on the ground, it looked like he was kind of, just kind of unwieldy. It's like me walking. It's not very pretty. It's not very attractive. The thing is, is that uh, it just, there's nothing, I mean, if, if Lawson is walking, I mean, he may be very, I mean, athletic. I don't know. I just see your picture. Holden there uh, with his sunshine in his background. He may be athletic and he can just run and, you know, jump and everyone's like, oh, how athletic is he? But then there are others of us on this call, me, for example. I walk and it looks like, man, is he going to fall over? That's kind of the way the Comanches were thought of. But you put them on the back of a horse, it just transforms them. They teach their children at the age of two and three and five, how to, especially their boys, how to ride horses. Not just ride them, but to ride on the side, to ride in combat. They could fire from the horse. They were extraordinarily effective as far as their hunting techniques, their fighting techniques, and at their prime, the Comanches are the best light cavalry in the entirety of the Western Hemisphere. Um, I, these sound, that's, that's a heck of a statement, and I can get sometimes kind of wound up, but this I, I'm serious as a heart attack with. The Comanches, in their prime, as, a, as an empire, the Comanches were the best light cavalry in all of West, the Western Hemisphere. They were that good. They were better than anything the U.S. could throw at them, any be better than the Spanish or the Mexicans. They were just that good. They oftentimes preferred bow and arrow over rifle and musket, and wisely so. They were What made them even better was they were not just that they could hunt and ride, but they could hunt and hunt well. They hunted buffalo, and they were good at how they did it. What they started to do 
was is that if you were if I had a, a dry erase board in front of me, I'd draw it like this. But what the Comanche would do is they would get into a, a hunting circle and they would kind of herd the buffalo together on the plains, wherever they were hunting them at, in Texas or up on the plains, it doesn't matter. And they start to ride in this circle around the buffalo. And as they started to ride, they were kept compact, compacting, compacting, compacting until they could get right up on, right up on to find us about 10 foot away, less in some cases, upon the buffalo. And they could draw their uh, bow back, let go, and drill the buffalo up between the shoulder blade and punch out the heart. They were good at it. And then as they started to, th then they'd take the buffalo and they'd carve him up and they would use pretty much everything they'd get their hands on. And then they'd pack it up. Uh, wind it up, preserve it, and off they go. They're nomadic. They're nomadic. And uh, when you talk about the Comanches, their empire is called Comancheria. Comancheria. Let me write that in your notes there. Comancheria. Uh, you will have uh, a, a Pacheria, but it's the difference between the uh, Spanish Empire and the British Empire. One's bigger and one's better. The British Empire was bigger and better than the Spanish Empire. Same here. Comancheria was far better. Comancheria, if you look at a map of Texas, runs from essentially San Antonio the, on the southern end all the way up through about where Dallas and Fort Worth is, out into the big country around San Angelo, Abilene, up through the plains, up through the Red River, up through, um, oh, let's see, up through Oklahoma and into parts of Kansas. It is really just this big giant U, which you can call Comancheria. That was their territory, and they controlled it. I bring all this up to you to tell you this, is that the Comanches, when they come to Texas, the Comanches are going to hit the Apaches like a Mack truck, and the Apaches are staggered. The Apaches, who hated the Spanish because of the Spanish footsie uh, with uh, the Spanish playing footsie with uh, the Cadoans, the Apaches, by the mid part of the 1700s, are trying to figure out how do we check the Comanches? How do we draw the Comanches uh, back? How do we check them? Because they couldn't outfight them. The Apaches were desperate in a sense. Perhaps this is the idea of the enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of the idea. So, what happens in 1749? And again, one of those big years. 1749, you get uh, the, uh, the buildings of San Xavier there at present-day Rockdale. And also in 1749, you're going to have about four Apache bra chiefs, four Apache chiefs come to Behar. And those Apache chieftains are going to say to the Spaniards and to the Franciscan uh, Catholics, the, uh, the Spanish Catholics of the Franciscan order, they're going to say to the Catholics and to the Spanish authorities, we want you to build a mission amongst us. Please build us a, uh, some territory. B build something amongst us. We, would, we need to have the Catholic Church with us. We want to become good Catholics. We want to settle down. Now, does everybody believe them? Not a bit. Not a bit. Most of the Spanish military authority, uh, most of the Spanish uh, 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 military authority there in San Antonio de Bejar, a guy named, uh, this fellow is worth noting, Diego Ortiz Perea, uh, D uh, Captain Perea, who is the, uh, the commander of military forces in Texas, basically says, there's not something not right here. They're lying. They're lying about it. But the Catholic priests were ecstatic. They said, this is the, the breakthrough we've always been hoping for. And so what the, uh, the, the uh, Spanish decide to do, they side with the church, and they're going to build what is called San Saba. San Saba. Now, some of you are thinking, I've been to San Saba. That's out in the hill country. Uh, this San Saba Mission Presidio Complex is not in where San Saba County is. It's out around Menard, if you know where Menard, Texas is, out there on the western hill country. San Saba is exposed. In fact, it's so exposed at one point in time uh, later on, a, uh, another Spaniard is going to make the remark. He said it was about as effective uh, trying to protect San Antonio as sticking a, a ship out in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean trying to protect the coast of Spain. But San Saba, that out in the western hill country, is, is going to be a mission and a presidio directed toward the Apaches. It, the, uh, the approach comes in 1749, and it takes about six years or seven years, actually, for it to be built. 1757 is when it's finally opened. The mission is three, no, it's about three to four miles from the Presidio. 
nice and long distance. So the mission, missionaries can do what they want to, and the Presidio can protect them, kind of, sort of. When the mission was opened, no Apaches came. Put that in your notes. When the mission was opened in 1757, there were no converts. There was no Apaches. Nobody was waiting at the door, knocking on the door, saying, let us in. We want to become Catholic. The Apaches had no interest in it. Captain Perea, who was stationed out there at San Saba with uh, this mission, said, there's something not right. Something's not right. There, there is a, there, there's trickeration at play. But they kept going. Then, in 1758, first part, uh, let's see, I think I got it written down here. Do, 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 do. Let me see, I'm looking at my notes as we go. 1758, I believe it was in, the, in August, maybe September. But uh, 1758, the Comanches start to come around San Saba, the mission. And the Comanches show up. And they are followed by some Wichita Indians and some Tonkawa Indians. Remember, the Tonkawas get with the top dogs, whoever they perceive that to be. And then in, the, in August of 1758, or early September of 58, the Comanches basically show up with war paint on. They show up in, on war attire, and they show up at the San Saba Mission, and they uh, ask what's going on. Who do they come around? Let's see. Hang on a sec. Let me... Let's see here, about 2,000 Comanche and allies. So they give you some numbers. About 2,000 Comanche and allies come around San Saba Mission, which has all of about five people, ten people in it. The Comanches raid it, and then they start killing people. When it's all said and done, they will slaughter out San Saba. They even kill the cats. Now, I don't want to ever tell that story. Those people like, oh my gosh, they, they killed all these people. Oh, they killed the cats. How terrible. But uh, the reason the Comanches attacked San Saba the way they did is because the Apaches had tricked them. The Apaches had killed some Comanches, and the Apaches had left behind Spanish mementos, basically indicating that maybe it was a Spanish attack on some Comanches. What ends up happening is, is that these uh, atrocities, these uh, slaughters, cause San Saba to be defended. And then the Spanish will go on the attack, and they will attack up the Red River. A battle ensues between, in 1759, excuse me, yeah, 1759. It's a mixed affair. I guess what I'm trying to tell you on this whole thing is, is that, uh, oh, by the way, a lot of what the Spanish tried in the 1750s ends up failing. The last turn of the worm in this whole story is this, is, is that after the battle up on the Red River between the Comanches and the Spanish in retaliation for San Saba's uh, destruction, the man who will be put in charge of the Mission Presidios of Texas, Captain Philippe Rabago y Tehran. And Captain Rabago is uh, going to try to redeem himself. He fails. But ultimately, as I say at the outset of these sorts of things, is, is that the, the Spanish period of Texas history is oftentimes described as a failure. The last thing I want to tell you about before I turn you loose and let you go for the day is uh, after the failure at San Saba, the failure at San Xavier, the middling successes at La Bahia and success at San Antonio, and certainly the middling success at Nacogdoches, the Spanish in the mid-1700s, 1759, 1760, and so forth, are going to send out a, a, send out a fact-finding expedition. Put this man's name in your notes, the Marquis de Ruby. And this is also one of those major events, Marquis de Ruby. He is sent from Spain... He's a Spanish captain. He travels to, New, uh, to Mexico City, up to Texas, and in the span of about three years, from 1766 to 1768, he travels over 23 months. He travels 7,600 miles on horseback. He travels from the Gulf of California out around San Diego, California, to La Bahia, to uh, Nacogdoches, and beyond. You can go into detail about the Marquis de Ruby's story and it, all that he goes through. 
but here's what I want you to take away from it. The Marquis de Ruby is going to make recommendations that the Spanish will follow that basically say, we can't afford the missions the way they used to be. The Marquis de Ruby looks around and says, one, missions are very expensive. They were supposed to be cheap, but they really are expensive. Two, the Presidios are expensive too. And so what the Marquis de Ruby says is this, abandon East Texas, which they mostly do for about a decade, bring everybody from Nacogdoches down to San Antonio to Bejar or Villa de Bejar, leave La Bahia and then draw a straight line from La Bahia and take everything south of that line, excepting Santa Fe, New Mexico and, and the Villa de Bejar. What the Marquis de Ruby does is this, and it's very simple. He basically, through his recommendation, through his fact-finding expedition, by the 1770s, Spain abandons their northern territories, including East Texas, including North Texas. And the Spanish retrench and pull back to Villa de Bejar, to La Bahia, and basically Texas is, yeah, it's kind of there. It, it, it's uh, going through the doldrums, to say the least. And uh, that's, uh, that's where we leave it today. But the Marquis de Ruby, I just gave a very short shrift to it. Your textbook will go a little more detail than I do. But the fact is, is that that is a major turning point in Spanish history. Because what's happening in Spain is this. Spain has uh, settled a war with uh, France and the Great Britain, and Spain has picked up a bunch of territory. The French threat is gone. Spain, put this also in your notes, by the late 1700s is running out of money. All those, uh, all those silver mines in Mexico, all those gold mines in, in Peru and elsewhere, they're not producing what they used to produce. They're gone, and they haven't found any new ones to help uh, refill the coffers. So Spain's running out of money, and they're trying to save money, and by abandoning those uh, missions, they, are try they do exactly that, or at least they attempt. So uh, I'll cut one more video. And let's see, I will uh, finish the Spanish period of Texas history. That's a good place to stop for the day.